Hi everyone, in this video we're going to work through an integral using a slightly unusual method, which is to start by turning it into a double integral and then later turn it back into a single integral and we'll see why that's a good idea for this particular case. So the integral that we are trying to evaluate is uh, the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus ax minus e to the minus bx all over x with respect to x. So it's a function of a and b. We're trying to evaluate this in terms of a and b. And I'm going to assume that a and b are positive numbers because then, um, well, that ensures that those exponential terms will get smaller and smaller as x goes off to infinity. And so this integral will actually converge. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is define another related integral, which we're going to use as part of our solution. So I'm going to call this other integral j. It's going to be a function of two parameters, x and c. So I'm explicitly writing in that dependence here, j of x and c. And I'm defining it to be the integral from 0 to c of e to the power of minus xy with respect to y. So let's evaluate that and see how it's related to i, right? So uh, if we integrate with respect to y, then you get back your exponential function e to the minus xy, but now it's divided by minus x because that was the coefficient of y in the exponent. We then have to evaluate that at zero and c and subtract those from each other. Right? So if we substitute c in place of y, you get e to the minus xc, or I'm going to write it as e to the minus cx, uh, then divided by minus x, and you have to subtract off 1 over minus x, because when y is 0, you get e to the 0, e to the 0 is just 1, right? So tidying that up a little bit, you can write that as minus e to the power of minus cx over x plus 1 over x. So all of this is equal to j of x and c. I'm going to rearrange that equation um, and deduce that e to the power of minus cx <coughs> divided by x is equal to minus j of x and c plus 1 over x, right? The reason for doing this is that this term e to the minus cx over x looks very much like the individual parts of the integrand of i, right? Because you have e to the minus ax over x and you've got e to the minus bx over x, um, which looks very much like e to the minus cx over x. So now that we've sort of written this part of the integrand of i in terms of this other integral j, let's use that relationship to rewrite i. So what I mean by that is we're going to say that i is the integral from 0 to infinity of, well, your first part of i, the integrand of i, is e to the minus ax over x. Using that relationship I've de derived in terms of j, I can write that as minus j of x and a plus 1 over x, right? because it was e to the minus ax instead of e to the minus cx. So we just replace the c with, a, with an a. And then the second part of the integrand of i was this minus e to the minus bx over x. And so I have to then add on j of x and b and subtract 1 over x. Right? We just flip the signs because that bit was subtracted in the original integrand. And all of that is integrated with respect to x. And then conveniently, the 1 over x is cancelled. So what we've done is to write the integrand of i in terms of j. So now we can go back and substitute the definition of j into that uh, rewritten form of i, right? So what we're going to get is that i is the integral still from 0 to infinity of, I'm going to put big brackets here because we're going to substitute two integrals into the integrand, right? So I'm going to get the integral from 0 to b of e to the minus xy with respect to y, right, that's coming from the j of x and b part, then I have to subtract j of x and a. So I'm going to subtract the integral from 0 to a of the same thing, right, e to the minus xy with respect to y. Close those brackets and then integrate the whole thing with respect to x, right? So now you may be thinking that this looks more complicated than what we started with because now it's a double integral instead of a single integral. However, we'll see that it does end up simplifying quite nicely. So firstly, notice that you can rewrite all of this stuff in the big brackets in my integrand there. You can rewrite that as a single integral, because if you integrate the same thing from 0 to b and 0 to a and then subtract those two values, that's the same as just integrating from a to b in the first place, right? You can convince yourself of that by remembering that one interpretation of an integral is that it's the area under a curve between the points defined by the, the limits, right? So what I'm going to do is rewrite i as the integral from 0 to infinity. Uh, my inner integral is now just going to be the integral from a to b of e to the minus xy dy, and then we integrate all of that with respect to x. Now, if you were to 
try and evaluate this integral here, you would end up basically back at the starting point and you wouldn't be able to uh, proceed. But here's where we do a useful trick. You can change the order of integration and say that, well, this is the same as the integral from A to B of the integral from zero to infinity of the same thing, e to the minus x, y, but now we're integrating with respect to x and then with respect to y. So I've changed the order of integration. The reason why that's useful is basically because when we substitute infinity into our negative exponential, uh, some terms are going to disappear because as x goes to infinity, e to the minus x goes to zero, right? So if we do that new, uh, new inner integral there, we keep this integral from a to b on the outside, but now we've got e to the minus x, y over minus y, because I'm integrating with respect to x. Um, that has to be evaluated when x is zero and when x is infinity. Then we have to integrate that whole thing with respect to y afterwards. But firstly, let's just do the substitution into that newly integrated inner part. So as we were saying, if we substitute x equals or x going to infinity, then you get e to the minus infinity, which tends towards zero. So part of that just disappears, and we are left with just having to substitute x equals zero into our expression there. And because e to the power of zero is one, all of this simplifies very nicely to just the integral from a to b of one over y with respect to y. Now that's just a standard integral. It's a natural log, and you end up with log b minus log a. And so it's a natural log of b over a, and there is our result. So I'd like to conclude by considering one particular special case of interest of this, uh, this integral i. Now, if you're a mathematician who likes rigorous proofs, then you're not going to like what I'm about to do. However, I'm not claiming that this is a, an actual proof. It's just an interesting observation that we can make about this. So consider the case um, where a is equal to minus i, in other words, the imaginary unit, um, and b is equal to just i, right? So already we've kind of... Uh, broken one of the assumptions that we made earlier, which is that a and b are positive numbers, right? So we haven't proved that this expression log of b over a should actually work in this case. But let's just see what happens. The reason why this is an interesting case is that there's this relationship between complex exponentials and trig functions. And so if you substitute a is minus i and b is i, you get uh, in that original integrand up there, you get e to the i x minus e to the minus i x um, all over x, right? Now using uh, complex trig trigonometric identities, uh, you get that i would then be equal to the integral from zero to infinity of two i sine x, right? Two i sine x is the same as e to the i x minus e to the minus i x, all of that divided by x and then integrated with respect to x. Now, if we were to assume that this log expression was still valid, although we haven't proved that it's valid, um, then that would be the natural log of minus one, right? Because i divided by minus i is just minus one. So this would suggest, again, if this were true, it would suggest that the integral from zero to infinity of sine x over x with respect to x is the natural log of minus one divided by two i. Now, what's the natural log of minus one? Well, you could look at the identity e to the i pi is equal to minus one. That's Euler's identity. And so if you take logs of both sides, you get i pi is equal to the natural log of minus one, right? So this might suggest that this whole thing should be equal to i pi divided by two i, which is equal to pi over two. Now there are other ways to evaluate this integral of sine x over x. It turns out that pi over two is in fact the correct answer, which is quite interesting. However, the reason why this method is a little bit problematic is because if we return to this Euler's identity e to the i pi equals minus one. So this is entirely true, but more generally, I can add two pi n times i, where n is an integer, into my complex exponential, and that identity will still be true. So if I try to take logs now, I find that log of minus one doesn't have one single value, right? There are infinitely many possible values you could take for that. So if anyone does have a good explanation of why this method happens to work, um, if we assume if we take the log of minus one to be i pi, I would be interested to hear it. But I just thought this was a, an observation that's sufficiently interesting to be worth mentioning.